Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hallelujah. You can be seated. Tell somebody you're excited. excited. Amen. So am I. You know, um, and, and let me tell you why. I'm not just saying that, uh, be saying it. Uh, Pastor uh, Chad and Sarah, I want to, first of all, thank you for, for inviting me. And Cindy, right? Thank you. You, you have, haven't you? Amen. Amen. But the reason th that I'm excited, I searched for five and a half years trying to find my place in the body of Christ. I'd go to church, you know, listen to the preacher, you know, and, and go home. And, and I believe there's some of you here, you've experienced this also. And I, I'd say to myself, there's got to be more. There's got to be more than just driving that building, sitting in that room, smiling at the pastor, listening to that message, and going home. And uh, I'll be honest with you, I got to a place where I thought, if this is it, forget it. Forget it. But thank God, we started going to a church that asked people to be involved. And, and I'm going to be honest with you, when they first asked for people to be involved, I didn't, I didn't volunteer. I'm going to tell you why. I didn't think they would want me. I didn't read the Bible all the time. I didn't pray all the time. I couldn't, you know, quote, scripture. And, and, and they wouldn't want somebody like me, I thought. Amen. But, you know, it, it was interesting. Nobody volunteered. The next week, the pastor asked, asked again for volunteers. And, and again, I, I said to myself, I said, well, they wouldn't want me. I, I don't read the Bible all the time. I don't pray all the time. You know, they, they, I don't have a lot of education. Uh, they wouldn't want me, but, but nobody raised their hand. But I thought, you know, I could do that. Now, I'm, I'm telling you a true story, okay? I'm being honest with you. I thought, I could do that. So I'm going to go ahead and raise my hand. And, 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 and this is true. I thought to myself, if I raise my hand in the past, oh, Buddy Bell, Buddy Bell raised his hand. Buddy, I, I just want to thank you that at least you raised your hand. But, Buddy, you, you, you don't pray a lot. You don't read your Bible, and, and you don't have a lot of education. But, but at least you raised your hand. I, I'm, I'm being honest with you. I thought if they say that, no problem. I'm not going to get upset because I understand completely. But you know what? They didn't say that. I took the next step, and things began to happen in my life. And so I, I'm excited. I'm excited when churches do what you're doing today, giving people an opportunity to take that next step. Open up your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Let's get started. Let me introduce my backup team that I brought with me. My wife of 52 years, amen. Yes. Kathy, amen. Stand up. Amen, amen. And then my, my who thinks she's my favorite granddaughter, Whitney. Whitney, stand up, amen, amen, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, Father, we just thank you for today and again for this opportunity to, to stir the gifts. And Father, I thank you that, that Reach Church shall never lack for people that have a heart for the vision that you've placed within Pastor Chad and Sarah's heart. And Father, I thank you on my behalf for clarity of speech and for simplicity of thought. And most of all, I thank you for the anointing, <laughs> that it flows like it's never flowed before. In Jesus' name, and we all said amen, amen and amen. We're going to start in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27. It says, now ye, and we're talking to y'all. He says, now ye are the body of Christ. <laughs> y'all full gospel, yes. right? <laughs> you're, you're, you know, nothing changed after you painted the building, right? Okay. All right. 
Now, church, you've never said amen, hallelujah, glory, or preach on preacher. You can do it today, okay? I loose you in Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> Don't get quiet on me. You get quiet on me, I get quiet on you, and you won't like that, amen. Let me read out of the Bible again. It says, now ye, and we're talking to y'all. He says, now ye are the body of Christ. Amen. amen. And members in particular. Each and every one of us are particular members in the body of Christ. We're not just members. Our Bibles say that we are particular members. Now, when I say the word particular, the other word I think of is special. Do you realize that each and every one of us are special members in the body of Christ? Amen. All people say amen, they nod their heads, but, but a lot of people, well, now, brother, buddy, I don't know if I'd say I'm special, brother, buddy. Now, 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 Brother Larry sits back there, he's special, I, I know that. And, and, and Sister Rose that sits over here, she's special, I, I, I know that, Brother Buddy. But Brother Buddy, I, I don't know if I say, I'm special. Oh, oh I'm here every time the doors open up, and, and, and I believe I'm 100% behind the pastors. And, 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 but Brother Buddy, I, I, I don't know if I say I'm, I, I'm special. But relax, you don't have to say it. The Bible has already said it for you. The Bible says that ye are a special member. Let me tell you something, church. We need every special member working and functioning properly in the body or the body just doesn't run right. Oh, it'll run. But we won't get the full potential, the full power out of the body if we don't have all the special members working and functioning properly. Can I have an amen? amen. Let, let me illustrate that this way, this example. Now, Kathy and I are originally from Illinois, okay? I was raised on a farm. If you want to get me real excited, just start talking about John Deere tractors and I get real excited. Amen. Y'all know what John Deere's are? There's John Deere's in heaven. Amen. Yeah, the Bible talks about things in heaven are green. Amen. <laughs> yeah. And then farmers with them red tractors, huh, we know where they're going. Amen. <laughs> I can tell we got a few today, amen. <laughs> amen. But I believe a lot of you be able to relate this. But one of the highlights of my life when I was growing up, before I turned 16, before I got my driver's license, was being able to go to my grandfather's farm and drive the vehicles. You know, driving the tractors, that was something. Driving the combine, that was something. But the big thing to me then was driving my grandpa's truck. Why? Because it had a clutch and it was four on the floor. But the only time we could drive that truck is when they were using it, when they had it out in the fields. Well, I remember one day I was at school and I knew my grandpa was in the field that day. So I knew <laughs> when the school got out, I'd get to go home and drive that truck. I'd get to shift those gears, pump that clutch. Man, I'm going to drive the truck. I didn't learn nothing that day in school. I mean, when they were teaching math, I was shifting gears. When they were teaching science, I was pumping the clutch. Amen. School bell rang. I got on the school bus. Had to ride it for about an hour. So I sat up close and I watched that bus driver shift those gears and pump that clutch. And I knew in about an hour, man, I'd be shifting those gears, pumping that clutch. I'm going to drive the truck today. I got home. I got on my bicycle. My grandfather's farm was about a mile and a half away. And while I was riding my bicycle, all I could think about, man, I'm going to pump that. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? Amen. I'm going to drive the truck today. I got over to my grandfather's farm. I came into the barn lot there and I saw the truck and it was sitting by the shop and it had the hood up. That's what I said. <laughs> oh, something's wrong. I went into the shop there. My grandpa was in there. He had the carburetor off the truck and he had it all tore apart on the workbench. I looked at him, I said, Grandpa, what are you doing? He said, well, buddy, the truck wasn't running too good. So I stopped, took the carburetor off, took it apart, going to clean it, put it back together here in just a little bit, and we'll get going again. I said, well, hurry up. <laughs> I've been waiting all day to drive this truck. So he started cleaning the different parts of the carburetor, started putting it back together, but I noticed something that he was taking more time with the littler parts of that carburetor than he was with the bigger parts of that carburetor. 
Tell you the truth, on a lot of the little parts, he would go over and get into a book and read about them for a few minutes before he would mess with them. <laughs> so I remember I told him, I said, Grandpa, Grandpa, don't mess with the little parts. Just put the big parts together, you know. I want to drive the truck. And he says, oh, no, buddy. Here. <laughs> he said, oh, no, buddy. He says, we've got to have all the parts of this carburetor, big and small. And we've got to have them all adjusted properly, he says, or this truck won't run right. And, and, and so I, 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 I told him, you know, that don't sound important to me, you know. And so he says, okay, buddy, I'm going to prove this to you. I'm going to put the carburetor together, but I'm going to leave out some of these little parts that you don't think are that important. And I'm going to prove to you how important they are. And so he put them over on the workbench, put the carburetor in the truck. He get in there, he fires it up. Mm-hmm. After a few seconds, it floods out. He says, now, buddy, the reason this is happening is because you think that these particular parts, these so-called little parts right here, are not that important. But that's why the truck is not running properly. He says, I'll prove it to you again. So after a few minutes, he gets in there, he fires that truck up, it takes off. But after a few seconds, it floods out again. Huh. You know, a lot of churches run that away. We jump in there at first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And after a while, everything floods out. So we let everything settle for a while. And then we'll jump back in there again. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and after a while, everything floods out again. Hmm. Why does this happen in some churches? I believe I know why it happens in some churches. Because, see, in some churches, we develop this attitude that all we need is just the big parts. Don't take a personal, Pastor. That all we need is just the big parts. That we don't need the so-called little parts. That we don't need to get into the manual and learn about every member and every part and how to finally tune and how to finally adjust every member and every part. Why? So that we will get the full potential, the full power out of the body like we ought to. Can I have it? Amen. Amen. Now look at your neighbor, smile real big and say, he is really talking to the people behind us. (laughs) It goes on in verse 28. It says, and God has set some in the church. Now, that's where I want to be. I want to be in the church. I just don't want to go to church. There are a lot of people today just going to church. I want to be in church. To be in church means to be involved in church. It says, and God has set some in the carburetor. Oh, excuse me, I mean the church. (laughs) First, apostles. I thank God for apostles. Secondarily, prophets. I thank God for the prophets. Thirdly, teachers. I thank God for people that can teach the word of God. Then after that, miracles. Now, am I in a church that still believes in miracles? Hallelujah. Then it goes on, then it says gifts of healings. Am I in a church that still believes that God heals today? And then what's that next little word? (laughs) Every time. Only a few of you saw it. Amen. Amen. That's the way it's been for over 40 years as, as the, Kathy and I travel around the world. You know, I'm amazed how many people have never seen that little word helps there. I'm often asked, is it in the Bible, brother buddy? But you know, Pastor Chad, I know why a lot of people have not seen that little word there in that verse. This is where a lot of people blink when they're reading that verse. They're wide-eyed, and they start reading it. Oh, yeah, apostles. Oh, yeah, prophets. Oh, yeah, teachers. Oh, yeah, miracles. Oh, yeah, gifts of healings. Oh, yeah, diversities of tongues. Amen. (laughs) And they blink over helps and governments. Listen, I know a lot of blinking Christians. (laughs) And I've been to a lot of blinking churches, too. Amen. (laughs) Look at your neighbor and say, we're not a blinking church. But there it is, it's in the Bible, and it says that God set it into the church. No man made it up. There is a rumor going around the world that Buddy Bell made up this ministry of helps. I did not make up the ministry of helps. I read my Bible. Look at your neighbor and say, read your Bible. And I discovered over 40-some years ago, my place, my part, My ministry is the ministry of helps, amen. Now, let let me give you the definition for this word helps. 
the Greek definition, it goes like this. It's as one of the ministrations in the local church by way of rendering assistance or especially of help minister to the weak and the needy. Or in other words, if you are rendering assistance, if you're giving help to the weak and the needy, now listen to me, you are operating in this supernatural ministry, the ministry of health. Now listen to me. It's a ministry is just as valid, just as anointed as if God had asked you to be a prophet. Thank you for those three amens, but we'll have at least five by four o'clock. Amen. (laughs) Why? Because our God is not a respecter. But I've been asking churches all over the world, what happened to us? Why do we respect some higher than we do others when we're in this thing together? Tell your neighbor that. Say, we're in this together. Some people ask me, how can you call it a supernatural ministry? Well, I'll tell you why. Because a supernatural God set it into the church. And if it's a supernatural ministry, then you can expect the supernatural, wherever you're rendering assistance, wherever you're giving help to the weak and the needy. When you're serving as an usher, you can expect the supernatural. When you're serving in the parking lot, you can expect the supernatural. When you're serving in children's church, you can expect the supernatural. When you're serving in the nursery, you can expect the supernatural. Listen, there were many times when I served in the nursery, when I opened up certain diapers, I was believing God for the supernatural, amen. (laughs) for a supernatural wind to go blowing through that place. Why is it the nursery never has ventilation? Why is it the nursery never has a window you can open up and let God's fresh air go blowing through that room? Can I have an amen? Let me give you another definition that's becoming pretty famous around the world. Uh, It was written in the 1800s by a Pentecostal holiness preacher by the name of God Bay. He wrote a commentary on the New Testament, and this is how he defines the ministry of helps, people who render assistance, people who give help to the weak, the needy. He starts off with the word O-H-O, and it's not O. That's how a lot of people respond to rendering assistance, giving help to the weak, the needy. Oh, why do they always call me? And on top of that, who gave them my phone number? When I go to a lot of churches off and ask people, what do you do here in your church? I'm excited when I ask people that question. Typical answers and responses over the years have been, oh, brother, buddy, I'm a bucket passer. Somebody's got to pass the buckets in our church. Our pastors are always taking offerings. I, I, I'm not making these up. Another person said, oh, brother, buddy, I, I, I'm a dirty diaper changer. Somebody's got to change the dirty diapers in this church. And tell you the truth, if I didn't, I think some of these babies would never get a clean diaper. Now, I knew what that nursery worker was talking about. I've served in the nursery. I know what a diaper looks like that's been left on all night. All that mother did on Sunday morning was grab that baby, wrap a blanket around it, took off for church and prayed that Brother Buddy in a clean diaper would be in the nursery. Amen. (laughs) When I served in the nursery, I had this model. You bring them in full, you'll take them home full. Amen. (laughs) Got to have an amen from the nursery workers. Amen. But Brother God, he don't start off, oh. He's excited. He starts off, oh. Y'all don't look at me like that. Some of of you are looking at me like, "Now, now where did they find you, brother buddy? across the river. Amen. That's where I'm from. Amen. Over there. But he starts off excited. Now listen to this definition. He starts off, oh, the infinite value of the humble gospel helpers. Thousands of people have no gifts as leaders are number one helpers. How grand revival work moves along when when red hot platoons of fire our baptized helpers crowd around God's heroic leaders of the embattled hosts. Yeah. Oh, yeah, what a definition for a dirty diaper changer, amen. <laughs> what a definition for a bucket passer, amen. What a definition for, for those that are going to take the next step here in the church and sign up in one of the ministries, amen. He starts off excited. I often tell people it's the same excitement that you experience when the prophet showed up here. You didn't have a different excitement for him than you do for your nursery workers, do you? 
If you do, then you're becoming a respecter in the body of Christ. And you don't want to become a respecter. We're in this thing together. We need the big parts and we need the little parts. Can I have an amen? Amen. Let me give you another definition. This is by Broadman. And they define the ministry of helps like this. They say, there is no hierarchy in the gifts of God. Can I have one amen? amen? There is no hierarchy in the gifts of God. Pastor Chad, one day I was preaching, and I made this statement. I said, big guns and little guns in the body. Holy Ghost grabbed me and said, wait a minute. I didn't tell you to say that. You ever had that happen? What, just once? Okay. <laughs> Holy Ghost says, no, there's no big guns or little guns. There's only one gun and you're all bullets in it. That's Holy Ghost, amen. I didn't get that from another preacher, but if you want to use this, you have to tell people you got it from me who got it from the Holy Ghost. He says, there's no big guns or little guns. There's only one gun and you're all bullets in it. A few days after that, I was meditating on that again. The Holy Ghost spoke to me. He said, but buddy, but buddy, The sad thing about it is when I pull the trigger, a lot of you don't go off. (laughs) Click, 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 bang, click, 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 bang, click, 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 bang. Sounds like church, doesn't it? Just every now and then somebody goes off for God. Amen? I don't know about you. When the Holy Ghost pulls the trigger on me, I'm going to be a bang for Jesus. I'm not going to be a click. Some churches are full of clicks. Think about it. You'll get it at Walmart later. Amen. (laughs) Got to click down here to click over here and to click back here. And that's all you hear in those churches are click, 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 click. It's time we start hearing some bangs. Amen. Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm going to be a bang for Jesus. They go on and they say this. The ministry of the church does not rest on status, but on service. Status does not impress God. Status does not move God. The only thing that impresses our God is service. Can I have an amen? Amen. They go on and say this, no gift that serves others is little. Can I have an amen? amen? And then they end with this. God uses both the stars and the candles to light his world. God uses both the stars and the candles to light his world. It just so be some are stars and some are candles. We need to settle the issue and stay on the light. And the light is Jesus. Can I have an amen? Turn to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. Let me introduce you to some people that we don't hear much about. Acts chapter 9. When I get to heaven, these are the people I'm going to look up. I want to meet them. Acts chapter 9, verse 36. It says, now there was at Joppa a certain disciple named Tabitha, which by interpretation is called Dorcas. This woman was full of good work, works and alms deeds, which she did. Thank God at least she did something. And it came to pass in those days that she was sick and died whom when they had washed, they laid her in an upper chamber. You know, uh, I'm going to get real with you here. Years and years ago, when I first read this, I thought, what are we doing talking about a woman? I was raised on a farm, you know. And uh, so what, what are we doing talking about a woman? So I thought, well, you know, we're done with her. She got sick, died, took a bath, went to heaven, so let's go on. <laughs> it gets better, ladies, Amen. <laughs> For as much as Lydia was not a Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, and I thought, praise the Lord, we're getting back on track. (laughs) They sent unto him two men, desiring him that he would not delay to come to them. Now, it took them four hours to get to Peter. I had some research done. It took them four hours to get there and four hours to get back. They'd been gone for over eight hours, Okay. Then Peter rose, went with them, and when he was come, they brought him into the upper chamber. And I thought, what are they doing back there? The woman done died, took a bath, and went to heaven. So they brought him to the upper chamber, and all the widows by him weeping and showing the coats and garments which Dorcas made while she was with them. And I thought... All she did was sew. 
I mean, I don't know a woman today that hasn't believed God at one time or another for a sewing machine. Moving right along. Amen. <laughs> what are they doing back there? She done got sick. I mean, she just sewed, mended clothes for her friends. I mean, really. I mean, I'm amazed she made it into the Bible. <laughs> Verse 40. But Peter put them all forth, kneeled down, and prayed, and turning him to the body. Now, let's get the picture here. Peter shows up. Everybody's weeping. They show the coats and the garments which Dorcas made. Here's Peter's chance to really show out to the crowd. But what does Peter do? He asked everyone to leave. And it's just him and Tabitha in that room. Peter kneeled. I want you to get a picture of this. So, I mean, she's just sewed and mended clothes and made garments for people. Peter kneels in that room. And he prayed. Over the last many years, when I'm sharing this, I often ask, what did Peter pray? What was his prayer? I often ask people, what would you have prayed? I don't have time to go around like I do sometimes, but, but I, I, just to yourself, what would you have prayed that day? Over the years, I've heard hundreds of opinions of a prayer that they think that Peter prayed that day. I have an opinion. I believe his prayer went along with Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10. Peter prayed, he says, God, you're not an unrighteous God. You will not forget our work and our labor of love, which we've showed towards your name, which we do minister to the saints and do minister. And God, Dorcas, has put forth a lot of work and a lot of labor of love, and you're not an unrighteous God. You will not forget. You have not forgotten. And he turns to the body, he said, Tabitha, Arise! And she opened her eyes. And it says that when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he took her by the hand and he presented her to the people alive. The Bible says that many believed in the Lord that day. Another question, why did so many believe in the Lord? You say, well, brother, buddy, he raised the dead. Yeah, I think maybe some believed in the Lord because of that. But I also believe that many believed in the Lord because they seen that even God sees the so-called insignificant ones, that others would say what she did was not that important. But God even saw her, and he wasn't done with her. We need every part, no matter how small, how insignificant you might think you be, might be. And maybe, maybe you can only serve once a month, once every quarter, once every six months. But the key is that you take that step. Let me show you one more, then we're going to. Wrap it up. Turn to Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6. And in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. They're coming up short on some assistance. They're coming up short on the ministry of helps. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Now, let, let me help you out with what they're saying here. 
They're not saying that they will not serve tables. Or uh, they're not saying, oh, well, I've done that. I've heard that when I ask somebody to do, well, please understand, brother, but I've already done that. Well, you can do it again. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and that, 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 what they were saying is we can't do everything. This is why, why Pastor Chad and Sarah are having this weekend. This is their way of expressing, we, we can't do it all. We need you. They went on and they said, wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business, and we will give ourselves continually a prayer into the ministry of the word. It says, in the same please the whole multitude. If you're here this morning or if you're online, you've never seen a miracle in the Bible, here's your first miracle. <laughs> Everybody was pleased. <laughs> and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip and five of the guys they ran around with, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. Now, please understand. All they're going to do is serve tables. All they're going to do is help with the widows. And they're having a special laying on a hand service. I mean, let's get real here. They're just serving tables. They're just helping with the widows. And they brought them before the apostles. And they prayed and they laid their hands on them. As I travel around the world, I've asked pastors, thousands of pastors, when was the last time you prayed over your ushers and laid hands on them? When was the last time you prayed over your children workers and laid hands on them? When was the last time you had a, had a special service just for those who serve and you prayed and you laid hands on them? When was the last time you had a Next step weekend to show to the people how valuable and how important they are to the church. They laid their hands on them. Now look at this. Immediately the word of God increased and the number of disciples multiplied greatly and a great number of the priests were obedient to the faith. You, you, you didn't see it. Immediately after next day or next step at Reach Church, the word of God increased. The number of the disciples multiplied greatly. And a great number of the priests were obedient to the faith. Look at verse 8. And Stephen, remember Stephen? Yeah, I'll help with the widows. I'll serve the tables. I'll be an usher. I'll be a greeter. I'll help in the parking lot. I'll get involved financially in missions. Remember? It says, and Stephen, full of faith and Where'd that come from? That wasn't mentioned before when they talked about Stephen. It wasn't until after. I'll get involved. I'll help with the widows. I'll serve the tables. I'll be an usher. I'll be a greeter. I'll serve in the parking lot. I'll go on the missions trip. And now Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Now, are you ready to shout? Amen. Let me read you this verse in the Amplified. Listen to this. It says, now Stephen, full of grace, divine blessing, and favor, and power. What is that power? It's strength and ability. You have that power on the inside of you. Over the years, I, you know, I've met people who say, well, you know, I would love to get involved in that, but I don't think I could do it. 
Listen, you've got the power inside of it. You've got that strength. You've got that ability on the inside of you. And all God is waiting on is for you to go, I'll get involved. I'll, I'll get, get on one of the teams. Amen. And you release. When you take that next step, you release that power on the inside of you. You release that strength, that ability on the inside of you. If you told me 40 years ago I would travel around the world, that my teachings right now are, are in over 40-some thousand Bible schools around the world in over 80 different languages. Over 300,000 people a year hear my teaching on the ministry of helps. Amen. If you would have told me that 40 years ago, I would have laughed. But I learned something. I learned to take the next step. And when I took that step, I released that strength and that ability on the inside of me. And as I take a, another step, it begins to grow on the inside of me. And that power, that strength, that ability is released through me. Oh, I wish I could make you do something for God, but I cannot make you do something. Amen. All I can tell you is that when you do take that step, that next step, you release that power that's in you at this moment, that strength, that ability that God has placed on the inside of you. You want to shout? Can you run in this church? I'm going to release the run right now. Go over to uh, chapter 7, and we'll, we'll end with this. Go ahead and give me a little... There you go. You know, I'll throw a little extra in here. The kings were looking for a prophet to prophesy. And a servant says, well, Elisha's over there. He's the one that poured the water upon the hands of Elijah. Now that was his resume. He was known as the one who poured water. You think, that probably didn't impress those kings. But you know what they said right after that? When they heard he was the one that poured the water upon the hands of Elijah, they said the, the word of the Lord is with him. And they came to Elisha, and here's his chance. He's going to prophesy. And what does he do? He said, bring me a minstrel. I want to sing a song. A lot of times we think that's the only reason they're here, is to help us sing songs. But it says that when the minstrel began to play, that the hand of the Lord came upon him. They're like, you know, old time preacher said, the spout where the glory came out. <laughs> Sometimes the musicians think the only reason they're here is to help people sing songs. But that minstrel brought the anointing. Amen. Church, we're all valuable. We're all important. But we gotta, we gotta release that strength, that ability. Thank God you're in a church that makes that opportunity real for you. I'll end with this. In verse 55, it says, But he, now he is Stephen. Stephen is about to be stoned to death. He's the first martyr in the Bible. It says, And Stephen, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens opened 
and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. You were taught, I was taught, it's in the Bible, that when Jesus went to heaven, he is sitting on the right hand of God, right? Right? When I first read this, I thought, oh no, there's a misprinting in the Bible. But it's not a misprinting. But, listen to me, church. It's the only place in your Bible where it is printed that Jesus stood for someone before they entered into heaven. And who did he stand for? I'll help with the widows. I'll serve the tables. I'll take the next step. I'll be an usher. I'll be a greeter. I'll get involved. I want to release that strength, that ability, that power on the inside of me. Can you understand Brother God Bay a little bit better now? Can you understand how he can begin to write, oh, the infinite value. How many people are gonna be saved at reach? How many people are gonna be healed? How many people are gonna be set free? How many people are gonna be delivered? How far will the presence of God reach through Reach Church? Oh, the infinite value. I'm talking about you. How much strength, how, how much abilities, how much power is in this church? Oh, the infinite value of the humble gospel helper. Thousands of people have no gifts as leaders, but we are number one helpers. How grand revival work moves along when, when red to hot platoons of fire baptized helpers crowd around God's heroic leaders of the embattled host. Would you stand up with me? Hallelujah. 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 Let's do this real quick. All, all the leaders that are going to be at the tables. I want you to come up here real quick. Real quick. Come on. Come on up here real quick. Hallelujah. I don't know if you realize just how important this Sunday is. But you will see after this Sunday is over how important this Sunday was. Okay. What, what do you oversee? Production. And your name is? You're over production, amen. <laughs> Addy, right? Did I say it right? Addy, all right. Go. You're over production, okay? Go, go to your, where your table's at, if you would. And, and who are you? Usher ministry, Larry Clark. Larry's over the ushers, right? All right, Larry, go to, go to your table. All right, who we got here? They're over reach kids, over the kids' ministry, all right? Go to, go to your table, amen. I want you to see all these leaders and who they are, amen. And over the altar, okay. JC, okay, you can go to your, your table, amen. And you are? Glenn is a greeter. You know, greeters are, are dear to me. That was the first ministry of health that I was a leader of, amen. I love greeting people at the door, amen. Amen. Go, go to your, your table. Kathy over the coffee shop. Yeah. yeah, I've had two sips my whole life. Uh, yeah, and the second was an accident. Amen. Amen. I was in Guatemala, and this lady was, was making me hot tea every night after I preached. So I, third night I come in, and she says, it's right over there. I picked it up, took a swallow, ran into the bathroom, spit it out. And I said, you just ruined my testimony. Amen. <laughs> So you're over the all over the, the coffee yes. and, and tea and water. Yes. 
the other good stuff. Yeah, soda. Amen. All right. Well, and John is over the parking lot. Amen. All right, John, go over there. Many of you sat here this morning. That power in you was stirring. Only you can walk to these tables. Taking the next step. What will happen, brother buddy? I don't know. But I know this. Something will happen. But it's up to you. It was up to me to raise my hand. And I thank God I did. I thank God I was in a church that gave that opportunity. Five and a half years I went to church, sat, listened, and went home. Was not given an opportunity. It's been a great, a great time. Let me pray over you, Father. We thank you for this morning. Holy Spirit, I thank you for speaking to hearts. And I thank you for every individual that will take that step of faith, take that next step, and release the power, the strength, the ability on the inside of them. Now, before you sit down, I want you to do something for me. I want you to turn to three people. Everybody say, one. One, two, three. Once you turn to three people one at a time, I'm going to watch you. I want you to throw your arms around and give them a hug and go, wow, and you can be seated. Hey, I want to thank you for watching the Reach YouTube channel. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe so you never miss a powerful message, live stream, or church update. You can find out so much more about what's happening here at the church by following us on Facebook and Instagram, as well as our website, reachchurch.us. While you're there, you can also help support the ministry and our vision of reaching and equipping people. Thanks for watching and God bless.